Hello, Hectivity. Welcome to the uh, 2016 edition. Um, I was asked to give this opening speech, and uh, I have to start with a terrible confession. Uh, unlike some experts and uh, thought leaders in this field, I, I cannot see the future, unfortunately. Back in 2003, when I got to the first activity ever uh, in Tatabanya, there were like 50 of us gathering there. Uh, I couldn't have imagined that I would be standing on the stage and uh, giving this opening speech to you. So I, I, there were no way I could see that. Also, I couldn't see that uh, today in 2016 I could uh, go online and just uh, pay for the exploits of the world's most advanced intelligence agency uh, using uh, untraceable cryptocurrencies, for example. Also, I couldn't see that uh, investment companies uh, will uh, ally hackers in order to bring down healthcare manufacturers because their pacemakers are vulnerable. Look up the Senju story, it's quite amazing. Also, I couldn't have imagined that uh, the US government will state officially that foreign hackers are tinkering with the presidential election process. So it's a quite amazing time, I think, that we are living right now. And uh, it seems that uh, our favorite uh, cyberpunk novels are coming into a re reality. But uh, as amazing as it is, it's uh, also quite terrifying. So uh, we feel, at least I feel, that we should do something about this whole situation and there are challenges ahead of us which we have to solve and challenges that uh, we are not yet uh, quite prepared of. So here you are at uh, Hacktivity 2016, uh, how this conference uh, uh, can help you to achieve these goals, to solve these problems, to foresee these problems and, and uh, finally solve them. Well, uh, I talked to many of you, many of uh, uh, speakers before, and uh, one thing about uh, Hacktivity that seems quite unique, so to say, uh, among the, all these uh, different uh, information security conferences is uh, what I like to call professional diversity. So please take a look around yourself right now. Uh, take a look at the people who are sitting or standing next to you, because those people are most probably having a quite different professional background, quite different professional experience that they can share. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, you can most probably learn something from them, uh, uh, get some new perspectives, and also there is a high chance that uh, you can also teach something to them also. So uh, what I want you to uh, want to ask you uh, in this opening speech is to uh, take this opportunity to cooperate, to talk to each other, have conversations, uh, think about new things, solutions together. And as, I, as a program committee member, I like to encourage you to think about things that you will uh, be able to present next year at this very stage. Um, about presentations of this year. Uh, so uh, it's also very important to uh, not just to listen to the presentations and the workshops and the trainings, but also to actively participate by asking questions and uh, telling your opinions, sharing your experience uh, with the presenters also, and also your peers, of course. Uh, this is uh, what makes um, a conference more than just, you know, uh, downloading videos from YouTube and watching all the clever stuff that clever people say. Now you have the opportunity to, act to actually talk to those people in person and to talk to each other. And uh, I think that's the salt and pepper uh, of uh, every uh, information security uh, event. Um, we. For this edition of Activity, as always, we try to um, bring together topics that uh, we feel are most relevant today. 
for example, uh, the security of uh, smart devices, iDevices, and we try to bring some presentations which will uh, be about the future, those uh, technologies, techniques, and problems that uh, will shape uh, our next couple of years or maybe uh, decades. An example of that uh, are uh, microarchitectural side channel attacks, uh, for example, that uh, will be presented tomorrow. Uh, so we hope that uh, this presentation will serve as a good base to, to give you a line of thought, uh, some ideas that you can uh, discuss and collaborate about, and, uh, and share your ex uh, experiences uh, from different kinds of, uh, of defense. So uh, some of you work in defense, some of you work in offense, and uh, I think it, uh, it will be quite beneficial to, uh, to bring these two teams, the red teams and the blue teams together, and I think activity will be a quite nice opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, to give you a, an example uh, of uh, how powerful that uh, combined uh, offensive and defensive thinking uh, can be, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce my, uh, our um, first keynote speaker, uh, who killed uh, probably a whole bunch of bugs of your uh, cell phones that uh, you're keeping in your pocket right now, and also demonstrated a real nice exploit against them. So um, he's a very special guy, and it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, a former Pontio Mobile winner and a Pony nominee, uh, Daniel Komarami. Uh, please give him a huge round of applause. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. How about a round of applause for uh, Buharata, right? That was great. <laughs> so uh, the security aspect of cyber is very, very tough. Maybe not even doable, OK? So uh, that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, obviously, to, uh, you know, for giving me this opportunity to come here to talk to you today about this topic, and uh, especially Buharata, who uh, actually gave me the idea for uh, this keynote originally. Uh, this goes back about a, uh, a year and a half, I think. Uh, we were having a discussion about, uh, you know, how come, uh, and I think that's a discussion pretty much everybody has had. Uh, how come you have all these big companies, uh, you know, your billion dollar companies, uh, you would think, uh, you know, they have all the resources, and, 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 and still, uh, again and again, they end up getting owned sometimes by, you know, really silly bugs. Uh, and there's this popular sentiment that, well, you know, that's because they don't care. Surely if they cared, you know, you wouldn't have these kind of problems. Um, and I think this was about the time, actually, when, uh, you know, Apple had that uh, infamous go-to-fail bug. And, uh, you know, that's particularly, you know, the type of, type of thing. And I think everybody has seen a disclosure like this. When, when you look at the bug and you just think to yourself, really? Like, seriously, you have a bug like that? That, that, that has to mean that, you know, you're not, you know, taking this seriously. Uh, and at the time, I was still uh, working for Qualcomm, so, you know, doing exactly this type of, you know, defensive product security uh, work. Uh, so I've come to it uh, with some years of experience of, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're I guess you're trying to do an honest job. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you again and again see that uh, certain things just kind of get in the way of you actually being able to succeed in, uh, um, you know, coming up with a, with a, what you would call a secure product, I guess. Uh, so when we talked about that, uh, you know, the, that I, I thought more about that and, and, and uh, kind of came, came up with, I guess, this presentation, which, of course, is mostly going to be opinion, not so much fact. So obviously, I invite you to you know, challenge any of the assumptions here. Hopefully, we have time for some discussion at the end, or if not, then in the speaker's corner, I guess. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, and I would like to... Uh, you know, go to the uh, title a little bit. So uh, that's the original quote that you see. Uh, you know, Bear Bryant, of course, is not a security practitioner in the CISSP mold. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, you know, most famous college football coaches. Uh, he used to coach at the University of Alabama. Um, and so this quote is attributed to him, and uh, he sort of captured this idea that, okay, you know, offense is flashy, and, you know, it's what gets you the uh, news articles. I guess that's sort of true for security as well. But at the end of the day, you know, defense, you know, has these built-in advantages. So if you take it seriously, you know, eventually you win with defense. Uh, and I think that's interesting because when you look at security, you know, that's what I argue here today. 
you actually sort of turn that inside out. And if you look at the game that we're trying to play, it turns out that you know, the odds are really not uh, in the favor of uh, uh, defense. Um, so let's talk about why that is. Uh, but I think if I try to give you this theory that, well, offense is winning, and here's why, but first I should somehow you know, prove it to you that this is true. So let's start there. And the first thing we have to talk about is, um, okay, we sort of have to define, okay, what is this game that we're playing that I claim that you know, offense is, uh, uh, is winning? And I think that's exactly where the problems start because for the most part, you know, from the offensive side, it's kind of, I think, usually clear what, uh, you know, what game you're trying to play. Essentially, you have some asset, you want to compromise some asset. You know, that's your game. Or you, know, you essentially want to you know, uh, make money, and that's your game. So sort of your goals are clear. Uh, and, and obviously, that means that you, know, you can develop some strategy, and you know what you want to do since you know what you want to achieve. But when it comes to defense, I think what we mostly have is, let me see if I can succeed at starting the gift. Yes, OK. Uh, by the way, that's the high point of the presentation, I think, that cat. So you know, really cherish that. It's all down here from here. Uh, so I think this is one of the games that defenders try to play, right? The fact of all of, OK, our goal is to get rid of all the bugs. Or you know, they say get rid of most of the bugs. Or you know, find the bugs before offense and these things. And I think that that's just basically a losing strategy uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, I'll talk to uh, you about why. But I think most people sort of tend to agree that, you know, ah, that's not what we should be doing. And, and, and there's, this, there's this more uh, popular sentiment uh, uh, most, more recently that, oh, no, that's not the game we should play. The game we should play is, you know, raise the attacker costs, right? Uh, and there's lots of talk, talks about this concept that, oh, what you have to go after is, uh, you know, make it more expensive for attackers. And that at some point, that's the concept, I guess, you, you price out attackers and they're gonna say, oh, you know, I give up, right? I'm not gonna do it because now it's too expensive. And what I think is that I think that's also essentially an inherently flawed strategy. And the reason for it is, first of all, you have to decide, okay, what attacker? What is this attacker that you're trying to price out even? and. Uh, you, you will hopefully see from, from some of the comments I make later that this is a very big problem, especially in, you know, in the mobile field and the embedded field, that there's this you know, uh, fog of war over, okay, who's your attacker even? Uh, and then the, the bigger problem is even if you would stick to some you know, attacker type that you care about, is uh, somehow you would have to actually know, first of all, you know, how much whatever you do is raising this mythical price of exploitation, so you would have to be able to assign some kind of value to what you just did. And secondly, uh, you would have to know how, when you're pricing anybody out. And I think that's the biggest problem, that I think there's virtually no evidence that you, can, that you actually price attackers out. I think what we're seeing more is, um, you know, as targets get harder, you know, the, 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 the price for owning them is getting higher. I think if you've followed uh, you know, in recent years now, there's, there's, you know, slowly more public information on, you know, how much money you can make if, you know, if you're playing offense. Uh, and what, what you're saying is that, okay, yeah, maybe some targets are getting in some kind of objective way harder to exploit, but the return on investment on them is, you know, keeping up with that. So, so there's, there's, there's not really this evidence that but well, if you look at, for example, obviously Jonathan here is talking about iOS. So if you look at, okay, is it, is it harder now somehow to exploit you know, an iPhone over the browser than it was you know, in 2007? I think in an objective way we can say yes, yeah, certainly. But I mean, has the price of you know, selling iOS exploits kept up with that increase of difficulty or has it even you know, you know, surpassed that? And I would argue that that's true. And at the end of the day, that means that the, the game hasn't gotten worse for attackers. In many ways, it's gotten much better for them. Now they are making you know, even better in ROI. Um, so this kind of means that you know, to begin with, the games that defensive uh, you know, players are trying to play is you know, stacked against them. Um, well, OK, so if that would be true, what I said, then there should be you know, some kind of data that actually shows that, well, you know, and the end result is, you got all these bugs. So I suppose I should somehow you know, show that. Um, but we sort of come up uh, against the problem you know, when we start focusing on you know, mobile and embedded space. Uh, and that's a problem of you know, telemetry data. Uh, 
So what I mean when I, uh, by that, uh, by telemetry is your availability to, to actually see the attacks in the wild and be able to say, okay, here you go. These are the actual you know, attacks that are happening. Uh, and so you know, I, I, I use that to guide you know, what I'm doing. And I think you know, traditionally in, in, in the desktop world and server world, uh, there's a lot more of that data available, right? Uh, but in the mobile space, historically, that's just not been the case. That's a picture, by the way, I took straight from a presentation by uh, Vincenzo Ayozzo, uh, which is called The Tale of Mobile Threats. It's a keynote he gave like six years ago, I think. You can find the slides online. It's a great talk. So, uh, and, and it's uh, finally still very uh, relevant today. So I, I advise you to check it out. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, OK, so there's just not really a lot of uh, data on, on the real attacks. And I think you know, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, but I think the biggest problem is that a lot of the types of attacks that you're supposed to care about when you think about mobile or embedded are the types that are actually really hard to even gather telemetry data for. And that's because you're supposed to care about you know, local attacks, proximity attacks, physical attacks, things like this. And that's not the kind of thing where, hey, you know, I set up my honeypot and I'm also going to get those server requests. Like you look at this, you know, this is the, 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 the bug du jour, right? The copy on write Linux kernel exploit or, or bug that just came out yesterday. Um, okay, how was that found, right? Some guy saw it in his uh, 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 packet capture data, right? So th this is something that, you know, works as... As a, as, a, as a detection mechanism in, in, in the desktop world and in the server world, where inherently everything is you know, remote and over a network that we have the good tools to analyze. But when it comes to mobile, uh, like I said, a lot of things are, are local. And then the second part is that a lot of things are going over networks that most of us are totally blind to. Obviously, I'm talking about the carrier networks. And uh, historically, there's just not been built out this infrastructure that allows um, uh, uh, vendors uh, to, to, to actually get access to, okay, well, this is what's happening on, on the devices that I care about. Um, well, you know, I obviously have to sort of interject my own line of thought here a little bit, uh, since you could think to yourself, hey, come, come on, you're, you know, you're conveniently putting aside, you know, the, some obvious counter arguments. So, so if, if you look at Google, I mean, they talk a lot about you know, all this massive infrastructure, infrastructure they've built out, for example, to, to know what's going on, right? And uh, I'm talking about, you know, th uh, if you look at, they gave a presentation of Black Hat in 2015, and then I think most recently, uh, this, this spring, they, uh, they updated their annual report on their state of the security union, and they talk about how they have these different mechanisms for, you know, detecting un untrusted uh, apps uh, and, uh, and uh, things like this. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the bottom line there that I want to say is it, that all of that is really just focused, you know, mostly very narrowly on this concept of malicious apps, right? Which obviously is a problem on its own, and I definitely concede that we have, uh, th that there's definitely telemetry data on that topic. Of course, that by itself is something, on the other hand, that you could argue forever. I think this has been going on for a long time, that, you know, Google says, oh, you know, 0.1% of devices ever get to see a malicious app. You know, it's like a small problem and it's contained and all that. And then, you know, antivirus when there's always say, oh, that's not true at all. You know, look at, you know, this malicious app we found in Google Play, this other one, this other one. Um, in any case, I just sort of, I wanted to acknowledge this, but more put it to the side, because I think if we wanted to talk about, okay, are there malicious apps in Google Play, I guess we'd be here for, you know, a very long time. Uh, but if you start looking at all the other aspects, you know, you start seeing that we are very scarce, you know, resources to actually get telemetry data. So, okay, how about this, you know, mythical, oh, you know, uh, IMSI catchers and, uh, you know, the misbehaving, you know, cell towers and exploitation over baseband. And really, there's just no real trustworthy infrastructure there. And I'm not talking about something for, you know, you, but even for the vendors that will say, okay, you know, are these attacks happening in the wild? And, you know, this is something that I really draw on in, in my personal experience. I spent five years at Qualcomm, one of the things really focusing on is baseband. And through all that time, I was essentially completely blind to like, okay, but I mean, you know, is there somebody exploiting basebands? Who's exploiting basebands? Is there any data seeing an actual basement attack, you know, in the wild? And I mean, you know, people put up some research on like, oh yeah, you can do these like IMSI catcher catchers, but for the most part, they are more like, you know, toy examples than real working things. 
Um, and this list goes on. So if you look at, uh, okay, iPhones, and you know, you know, are iPhones misbehaving? You know, do we have data on that? And I think pretty much the only case where we, have, where we would have seen something on this is, you know, Section 9's recently, you know, put out this app, which I thought, you know, that goes in the right direction. And then obviously, like, you know, Apple shut that down in, you know, very short amount of time. So we're kind of going back to, like, you know, blind city. Um, and then you have something like Google Safety Net. But again, if you look, look behind, okay, what is Safety Net, then what they're doing is, you know, they are essentially uh, trying to detect, you know, known attacks. So when they patch code, uh, even in system services, so not talking about apps, then they add uh, a, a patch that will not only uh, uh, prevent the bug, but it will say, oh, well, this is actually, this bug was going to happen, so I'm going to report that. Uh, so uh, the obvious problem there is that's not going to do you anything for zero days. Um, and then there's another problem with this whole thing, which is that, you know, I wouldn't want to stand here and argue that it's impossible to build these things out. In fact, I would definitely, you know, try and encourage vendors, you know, you should try and do more of this. Uh, but there's a problem here, which is, you know, be honest. I mean, how many of you even turn on, you know, when you're registering your Google phone and it asks you, hey, would you like to send all this enormous amount of data about how you use your phone? I think this room probably over represents the number of people who say, well, yeah, definitely not. Thank you. Um, but if you think back about, you know, for example, the scandal that we have with Carrier IQ, I think these are examples that show that, you know, in this sort of more privacy aware age, this is actually something that's really hard for vendors to push that, oh, well, you know, now we want to sell this idea to the customers or the end users of, let's say, a phone or a router or whatever, that we will add these seemingly very invasive techniques to, 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 your, to your operating system so that we detect a lot more of what's going on here. Um, so, so it's not only that these, these, these systems, you know, don't actually exist, it's also that it's not just a technical problem, but I guess in this state, it's really, I think, a cultural problem to, to create that. Um, and of course, I should mention that at the end of the day, um, the, 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 there started to be in this, you know, sometimes we sort of get a peek behind the curtain. Uh, the Pegasus was an example of this, where, you know, all of a sudden, out of the sky falls, hey, here's actual targeted again, attack against you know, an iOS browser. And, uh, but but I, I think that, on the one hand, I think when, whenever we've seen these, it mostly supports the argument that, well, you see, in, in the wild, you know, clearly these things are being exploited. But on the other hand, I think, um, for the most part, as data, we can almost dismiss that because it's, it's, it's so, I think it's very small, it's like a drop in the ocean. So, okay, there's less one case. Okay, what does that really tell us? Are we, like, any that much smarter? I think it's a little bit similar with all the, you know, disclosures that came out of whistleblowing and stuff like this that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not that much data to, to give you, an, to, when, you know, we're not talking about you had, you had a previous agenda and you thought in your head, oh, I'm sure that's happening. And then you see something like that, you're going to feel validated. And you're going to think, that, yeah, I always knew it. I knew it. The NSA is sacking the Germans. I knew it. It's there. I called it. This is true forever, right? But the problem is that when you're a vendor and you're supposed to be, like, aligning your security strategy to something and make decisions on we have to drop everything and focus on that, then these type of like random data points actually really don't give you all that much. Um, so what I would like to do, uh, in addition to, to really support this argument that offense actually is winning, even though we are absent of data to show that, in my opinion, is sort of reduce the argument uh, to just say, um, okay, you know, in my opinion, I posit that you know, published security research is always a lower bound for the actual capabilities of dedicated attackers. And so the corollary is, if you look at security research and it, and it shows that, you know, all these things are compromised with ease, then what that tells us is, you know, real attackers are, you know, even doing better than that. So, you know, if you give me that, then now I suddenly have a very easy time because, uh, I mean, the news is full of this. So I have a couple examples here on this slide and an accident. You know, all of this is from the past four months, so it's not even like I had to put all this together. Uh, from a longer period of time. And uh, when, when you look at this slide, for example, everything here, these are exactly the type of attacks that, okay, if this is happening or not happening, you're just not gonna know. Just look at the, the, these, these problems, these are all local attacks. You know, there's, there, there's virtually no telemetry capability anywhere right now that would detect these things actually happening, right? Uh, but then, you know, okay, those were local, but then there's a whole bunch of things also super recent, you know, that are remote attacks. But again, our interfaces and types of targets that, you know, there's no such, 
you know, infrastructure there. Um, that's actually, I think, the, the, the hack about uh, the, the connected drive in BMWs that was particularly interesting in the article, they talk long about this problem that, oh, you know, and okay, is this happening in the wild? Well, nobody knows because, well, we have all these statistics from the FBI and well, there's all these cars stolen in the US and they not exactly know, you know, how, but okay, we don't know. So it, it's, okay, may, maybe it's really this type of hacking. Maybe nobody knows, yeah? Okay, now I sound a little bit like, you know, maybe there's no hacking. Maybe it's a 400 pound kid in the basement or whatever it was. Um, but the bottom line is, if we go from, you know, public research, I think, you know, we can deduce this, that, right, offense is winning. So, and now, let's talk about, you know, why that's the case. Um, and I think this is interesting because, okay, I've said all this, right, all right, you know, there's problems with the game and all of this, but the, the idea is supposed to be that, okay, offense has its own built-in advantages, this is true you know, for the reasons that we talked a little bit about. But then defense is supposed to have also its advantages. You know, it's supposed to have, you know, you're the owner of the code, so you sort of get to move first. You know, you're a big company with huge resources and all these things. Um, so the concept is supposed to be that, you know, even there's this offensive advantage, you can, uh, you can uh, even that out. Uh, but what I've seen and, and what I believe is that uh, your, your, your supposed advantages actually erode for totally different reasons, and, for, and that's why in the end, you know, you, you're, you're not able to, to even out this offensive advantage that just sort of comes from the game. So, um, so what are these problems that, that mean that, uh, you know, defense, you know, doesn't have good, uh, good chances? So I think... Uh, something that, you know, is very important and, and uh, probably the biggest issue is, uh, you know, the reality is uh, the company that makes all this stuff, it's actually never such a big company. This is just simply not true. It sounds like it's true. But what actually happens is, take the Pixel, for example, you know, made by Google, right? It's a Google phone. Finally. It's not OEMs. It's not this. It's not that. Now they, you know, got their stuff together and made the phone. And it's them. And now it's a Google phone. And, you know, that's true except, you know, it's a total black box to them how the OMA DM was done, what the crypto engine is in its hardware design, you know, what the secure world firmware is, what the hypervisor firmware is, what the baseband is, what the image processor is, what the resource power management core is, what the bootloader in the ROM is, what the EMMC firmware is, and this list goes, this list goes on and on and on. Uh, oh, and by the way, also they don't know the, you know, the keys to, to the signed firmware. Um, and at the end of the day, you end up with, well, some of these critical parts of your stuff that actually, you know, give the keys to the kingdom to, to attackers, that's not even being developed by some big company at all. It's been developed by some small third-party vendor that's, that, that's totally absent of all this advantage of like, oh, we're a huge company with resources and history and all of this. Um, and then, you know, Google is just sort of putting all that together. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I pick on Google, but it's not... Not necessarily fair. I mean, they are, if you compare it to some other, you know, players, they're in a super position. I mean, if you start talking about cars, I mean, then it's way worse, right? Then, you know, a company like Volkswagen or Audi, I mean, they make the car, but when you start looking at the ECUs, you know, they essentially didn't make any of that. And all of that is a black box to them that was delivered based on specifications. And they have about as much advantage, and that's the point I want to make, that the idea was supposed to be that you're the defender, you have an advantage when it comes to finding bugs in this thing. But what turns out to be the case is that you are in exactly the same position as the vendor, as some other guy who was going to turn out to be your, your attacker. It's just some black box to you as well that you have to integrate into your product. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, there's been some high-profile failures essentially stemming from this. I think one of the biggest ones has been, uh, you know, the, the issues with, uh, with Red Band that um, uh, Matthew Solnik uh, uh, has uh, disclosed a couple years ago at Black Hat, which basically this resulted in like remote jailbreaks in iPhones. So just about, you know, the most high profile target in mobile. Uh, and essentially it came down to, oh, you know, by the way, there's this piece in your iPhone which has a completely remote interface which can be woken up over SMS and, oh, it's super buggy, and, you know, Apple didn't even know. Uh, but, you know, you can give other examples. We have seen a lot of this trust zone research uh, against uh, QC, Qualcomm's implementation, and if you look at the actual owner of those phones, so like you say Google, or, you know, 
that that thing for for them is just another black box, uh, uh, you know, closed source firmware that you know they don't particularly own. They just put into their phone and hope. Well, this is going to be the root of trust for my full disk encryption. You know, turns out, uh, you know, it's not so great. <laughs> Uh, or another great example, I think, is uh, also over this summer, uh, researchers disclosed uh, these, these issues with uh, Volkswagens that allowed them to um, uh, crack the, uh, uh, the, the key fobs, essentially remotely open the cars. And what that came down to was, all oh, right, well, that was based on a chip that comes from an XP. Um, and Volkswagen said, well, you know, well, okay, well, that's an NXP chip, we didn't know. And then the NXP people just said, oh, right, well, you know, yeah, that's a super old version. It's using this, you know, high tag too, but oh, we have discontinued that forever and we've been telling customers don't use that. Okay, great. Well, you know, looks like, you know, Volkswagen was not aware of that. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the biggest issues. Another big problem, and, and it's sort of funny because it's almost the exact opposite of this, so it sort of shows that, you know, when you're in defense, you just can't win, is this concept of, well, you know, and it's actually why I think a lot of times vendors fall back to, well, I'm just going to take somebody else's stuff, is that you have to make everything from scratch when you're you know, making a mobile phone or you're making a car or whatever. It, you know, a lot of the security problems, and these are non-trivial things to, to, to engineer, you know, are not solvable by just use OpenSSL, right? There's no you know, off-the-shelf, and I'm not talking the type of off-the-shelf where you go to Stack Overflow and you copy-paste, and it's obviously a terrible solution, and you shouldn't have done that. I'm talking about reasonable, good, you know, off-the-shelf advice that you could just follow and do. Uh, instead, you have to build things from scratch, and, uh, and you should not underestimate the difficulty of doing that. And then the data sort of shows, I think, that, yes, that's hard to do. I think one of the biggest examples of this that, that we see again and again and again is, is the problem with entropy, um, which is, you know, when you're supposed to be designing a router or a phone or, you know, some car ECU, this is really a non-trivial issue that, okay, you have to make a chip out of scratch and you have to design into it some kind of hardware that will always give you great, you know, entropy right, right at boot time, right? Um, that's, that's not easy to do, especially when you have basically no uh, good, uh, uh, you know, model to follow for that. And then you have problems coming out of this. Uh, probably everybody has heard about the Jeep hack that you know, Charlie Miller and, and Chris Velasek has done. And uh, uh, one of the early things that they were able to do is actually crack the Wi-Fi password uh, or, or show that they can crack the Wi-Fi password or, or in the, in the uh, uh, onboard uh, uh, Wi-Fi that these cars have. And, and what that went back to was, well, the design for getting early boot time entropy was just really bad. And because of that, you know, the passwords that ended up being generated were you know, useless and easy to crack. Um, so, you know, this is a problem, and there's, there's sort of another aspect to this, which is when I say everything has to be made from scratch, well, even in cases where, you're, where you think you're doing the right thing, which is to say there is actually, oh, it's not that bad, some consortium or whatever thought about it, and there's a specification, you should follow that. And turns out even when you do that, you know, sometimes those things are just bad, right? So I think uh, one good example of this is, uh, uh, actually this was just published this summer at USENIX. Uh, uh, some researchers showed that the, the, the 802.11 uh, 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 group key generation uh, in, in a lot of routers is completely broken and easy to, uh, uh, to crack. And uh, turns out why was that? It was because, well, there's a specification for how you sub generate group keys, but turns out that specification is so broken that if you as a vendor would do that, it would be so slow that it would be unusable. So of course, you know, all these vendors try to do the right thing and then we're like, well, this doesn't work at all. Like I'm not talking about it's not secure, it doesn't work. So now you have to go back and do it from scratch. And you know, guess what? You know, the various attempts that they came up with, you know, weren't so great. Um, so the next problem, I just want to touch on this briefly because I think it, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, but it's still an issue, is that, well, there's an aspect of a text that you're supposed to care about where, you know, normally the common wisdom is that, well, that's when we give up, right? And I'm talking about exactly local attacks. I'm talking about physical access. That's one of the mantras in security, right? If the attacker has physical access, it's game over. They always win, right? Forget it, dude, let's go bowling, right? That's, that's, the, that's what we learn in school. Yeah, physical access, game over, right? But the problem is when you're making a mobile phone, then, for example, you're supposed to 
you know, come up with a solution where when somebody's phone is confiscated or, you know, stolen, uh, you know, you can't, you, you know, it, it's, it still should be secure against, you know, compromising that phone. Uh, and you're, so, so there you are. You, you've learned this common wisdom that, yeah, that's a losing game. And then people say, oh, well, yeah, but you're supposed to do it. So, you know, you can, you can see how that's not easy. And, you know, of course, you know, we do see that, that this, again, uh, ends up failing. I think, again, one of the most recent examples of this has been this whole thing with the, uh, uh, the passcodes on the iPhones, with this unfortunate uh, uh, San Bernardino case. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some months later, this uh, uh, Russian researcher showed that, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, you can clone. Uh, the NAND, so it's actually, here you go, a couple hundred bucks worth of work to, uh, you know, to get around this. Um, and I think, really, you know, as much as we are, you know, not doing so well in, like, software-based, you know, uh, exploitation, I think it's becoming increasingly obvious that we are so far away from, you know, in commercial products, you know, robust anything against, you know, physical access attacks. Uh, so it's sort of like, well, here's your phone, here's your high-profile thing that you're supposed to be doing well, and there's virtually no indication that you even have a chance of doing that. All right, have fun. Uh, and then the next thing. So I think, you know, if, again, this is something that I, I think I could not mention, um, but I do want to defend companies here a little bit. So, you know, people talk about, uh, oh, you know, oh, there's a backdoor, there's a backdoor, you know, it's because they're nefarious. You know, in my, ex in my experience, the problem is a lot more uh, you know, you have some product security team and it's trying to do something, but then the rest of companies doing, you know, different things. One of the biggest things is I like to say, you know, these are not really backdoors, they are debug doors, right? What this is is, all right, well, you know, we're putting this product out there, but, you know, we get field reports, we get non-working devices, so we have to actually maintain some ability to go and figure out what's going on when there are things wrong. And, you know, this, these are non-trivial problems. I mean, this is something that, you know, phone vendors face all the time that, you know, they put out some product and the, and the network carriers come back and say, yep, no, this is definitely not working properly. I'm not getting 3G. This, this whatever scenario, it's not working normally. So then you, you have a finished product and you're supposed to go and, well, debug its baseband. Mm, all right, well, if you've locked that phone down completely, then you have a problem. And this is really not easy when you start thinking about it well, you know, you could design in some solution where it's somehow perfectly secure. Uh, but, okay, how are you supposed to do that? Uh, are you going to actually, uh, you know, hold on to some private keys or something that lets you get in? Because then inevitably you get into this cultural problem when people say, oh, yeah, 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 you're playing into the hands of the FBI or whatever. That's where you kept your keys. Or, you know, you could say, well, you know, no, there's a way to do it you know, design a system so that when you really have to get in, first it wipes all the user data and resets the phone and then you can get in. Well, that's great, except, you know, that phone was already working fine in the tests when it was the pristine thing. That's not the problem. The problem is that the carrier is coming back to you and saying, well, this thing here doesn't work. Well, then you can go and wipe it and do your tests and it's going to work and, you know, you've achieved exactly nothing. So it's, it's really a non-trivial problem, so you get stuck with it. And the other problem with this, the rest of the company is doing something is that you know, there's a really a very long, you know, tail of products at a lot of these companies. My favorite example is, did you know that Samsung actually makes tanks, like literal tanks? And the thing I love about this is that recently I talked to somebody at Samsung and I made this joke to him as well, and you know, he didn't know, right? So I think this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, that you got all these tools, all these things that, you know, actually fall under your umbrella, but a lot of them you're not even aware of. And then there's another aspect of this whole other people are sort of eating your lunch, is that the rest of the ecosystem is doing something else. And here I'm talking mostly about, you know, the uh, type of thing where, you know, you have somebody downstream and then they go customize the thing that you built. I think, you know, people from Google, for example, could, you know, talk about this all day, that they try to build something and then it doesn't matter because then somebody else downstream, you know, compromises that stuff. Well, you know, okay, well, hey, well, take responsibility for it. So. You know, now go and also look at that. Well, that's great, but now you're looking at a finished product that you also have to literally go to the store to buy. So that means you're exactly in the same position as the attackers, right? So that obviously means that all your built-in advantage is gone. Um, so that doesn't, you know, play very well. 
And then, uh, you know, another problem um, is that uh, even if you do all this, uh, well, obviously, you end up with some, problem, some problems, uh, but the problem with these problems is that sometimes they just never go away. Uh, and some old versions, they, well, this one of the problems that, you know, old versions just stay relevant seemingly forever. I talked about this NXP issue with the Volkswagens, and that's a great example of this, right? Okay, you know, hey, that's, a, what a blast from the blast. What a blast from the past, right? Oh, here's, you know, here's this uh, a product line that we knew it was problematic, but hey, we improved it. That's not what we've been selling for, you know, however, six years or whatever. Uh, but guess what? It's still the thing in, 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 in the things that actually, you know, are out there. Again, in the, in the car industry, this is a huge issue because they come much more, from, much more from a culture of, you know, reliability. So once they pass tests on some, you know, piece, some ECU or whatever, that's going to stay in cars for a really long time. So, you know, that means that if you make a mistake in whatever, 2007, all right, well, that's going to be, you know, staying with you for a really long time. And another issue is with this bugs never die problem is that, well, you know, yeah, but you should patch everything, it would say. Uh, well, I don't want to get into the whole thing about like how patching is hard and all of that because we definitely don't have another three hours. But an aspect of this I want to point out that's actually specifically hard in my experience in, in fields of you know, mobile and embedded is that, well, one thing you need to have if you want to have any chance of patching proper, properly is regression testing, right? You need to be able to make sure that if you have fixed some problem, then from that point on, all the products you're putting out there don't have that problem anymore, right? Otherwise, you know, these things are going to come back, they're going to crawl back, and you're going to be back where you started. But the problem is, again, we come back to what are the kind of interfaces you're supposed to be protecting. And some of these are actually really hard to regression test for, just in terms of the cost of it. I talked about the entropy. So this idea of, well, OK, now go and do, you know, verify that the random, num random number generator is putting out good early boot time entropy on every single type of product you're putting out. Oh, and by the way, also do that for the final products because the OEM might have modified that and do this for everything, that's really hard. Or here's another example in routers and things like this, people often talk about, well, the problem is that it's so easy to get in at the first place because you have these UI accesses and JTAG and things like that. Okay, so as you're a vendor, you're supposed to ter be turning that off. Okay, well, this means that at, from this point on, when you have drawn a line in the sand and said, well, from that point, now on, the things that leave the factory, JTAG has to be disabled. Okay, so you're gonna take every single product and take it apart and solder on a JTAG header just to make sure, yep, no, it's turned off. And by the way, you're gonna do this for everything that you buy from the stores because now you're gonna start buying every phone that was made with your chip just to make sure that's the case as well. So, you know, that's not very economical. And even if this was fine, even if you were able to solve your problems properly, even if you were able to say, well, once I patch something, you know, from now on it stays patched, a really big issue is that the best batching strategies are completely misaligned, right? Uh, I think a big, big example of this is that you see it is with, uh, with Google and Qualcomm. So for a long time, none of them were putting out advisories. Then Qualcomm started to put it out, out advisories, and they have this cadence of when they have a bug, they put out an advisory. And then recently Google decided they're also going to put out advisories, and then they have a cadence of monthly doing this, right? And so this is great because this is you know, misaligned. So now what's happening is essentially, you know, again and again and again, Qualcomm is just giving you this like free, ah, oh, hey, here you go, here's a bunch of old days that we fixed, you know, in whatever number of weeks or something, there's actually gonna be a patch cycle where hopefully Google is actually gonna put out the advi advisory for that, meaning the fix for that. But in the meantime, here's the bug, you know, just in case somebody cares. Uh, and then, you know, this is something I wanted to mention that there's kind of this, at the end of it, there's this inconvenient truth about uh, what you're supposed to be doing at the end, which is patching, right? Which is that, you know, we have this wisdom or this rule of thumb that, you know, the quote, right thing to do is reporting bugs, right? Is the disclosure and, the, and, and, and then the wrong thing is hiding bugs or, you know, selling bugs and things like that. But then, Unfortunately, that's not what the data shows, right? The data shows that when advisories go out and zero days become old days, you know, then it's exactly those problems that end up, you know, trickling down into, you know, attacks that you actually see in 
see, you know, say, you know, malware apps and things like that, you know, the privilege escalation things they use. I don't think they are zero days. I can personally not recall a single case that was documented where, oh, you know, here's a malware app that was fine in Google Play Store and look, it used its own kernel zero day. What we see instead is, oh yeah, it's old days that was, you know, published by some whatever researcher a long time ago. So kind of even at the end of the day, uh, you're just helping the attackers. And I think, you know, there's another other aspect of this, of course. So why, why, are, you know, why are companies doing this? Why are we disclosing things? I honestly think I think the biggest reason for this is that, I mean, there is a value in it, but that value, I think, is not really a technical value. I think the value is basically you're buying goodwill with that. I think there's this, like I said, there's this expectation you're supposed to be doing it. So that's a good thing to do. And even, you know, when I was working at Quacko, I would say, yeah, we should be doing that because, you know, that's when people are going to see you in a good light. And I think... You know, there's definitely merit to that, so there's sort of like an economic reason to do it that way. But if you reduce it to you know, sort of our aspect of technically, is this helping you not getting owned? You know, not really. So we are super running out of time, so I have very little time. Uh, but there's just a couple of things I wanted to mention uh, that, uh, uh, that I think, you know, vendors in any case are doing wrong. Uh, so we have or at least I try to talk about all these things that, you know, make it really hard for them. But nonetheless, you know, there are things that they are doing themselves that they really shouldn't be doing. I think one of these biggest problem is that, well, I talked about the fact that there's no telemetry data, so sometimes it's, it, you know, it's convenient to actually react to these black swans. So the concept of a black swan is, you know, some, some research result that is so shocking and, and rare, uh, but the, 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 the reality of that actually happening in the wild is, is very little. And I think this happens a lot in security research because, to be honest, that's what we as a community value, right? Original awesomeness, right? This happens all the time in desktop. People say, like, oh, here's this like, super amazing attack chain. By the way, real attackers use Java. So it's a little bit like that, right? And so, well, in this world, there's no real attackers. We don't see it. And so companies go after these black swans. I think. I really debated whether I should say this. Some people will not like it. But honestly, I think stage fright was a little bit of an example of this. When, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, you know, over SMS and all of this. And so, like, huge resources went into that. There's virtually, you know, no, no evidence that, you know, that's how, you know, Androids were, you know, have been or will be, you know, getting going, right? Nonetheless, you know, that's what they were spending the time on. Another problem that I, I like to pound on, so this is something that people talk about. Oh, yeah, you're wrong, man that people talk about um, as a silver bullet. Ah, oh, you have to think like an attacker, and then it's all going to be great. And I just wanted to mention this, that I think, you know, that I think that's one of those, those things that sounds great, but it doesn't really make that much sense, in my opinion. The reason for this is that the way attackers think is they want to get it done. So their goal is, well, let's, oh, yeah, they talk about it's a graph. You know, find the one bug and find a way in. Right, but as a defender, you can't do that. I mean, you cannot play the game where I just had to compromise it. I did it. It's great, we can ship the product now because I found the one exploit. So we're done. There's definitely no other exploits. There was only the easiest way in. There's no second easiest way in. That doesn't work, right? So as a defender, what do you do? Okay, I thought like an attacker, I found the easy exploit. Great. Now let me go back and think like an attacker again and find the second easiest exploit, right? And so at the end of the day, if you will, instead of thinking lists, you know, you got to end up thinking lists of graphs, right? Because you're supposed to, you know, find all of them. So, and I'm not saying... That's a bad thing for vendors to do, to think about how they look for bugs in that way. I'm just saying that's not a silver bullet at all. Uh, and then this is another thing as I, I, I briefly wanted to touch on that. Um, you know, there are, like I've said this before, that for you know, mobile vendors and embedded vendors, there's not a whole lot of things to fall back on, like this is how you're supposed to be doing things. But one of the big things people talk about is like, you know, the secure development life cycle, right? And this worked, you know, Bill Gates stopped Windows development in 2000, 2003 and all of this and look at how great it was and this is what everybody has to do. But, you know, the problem with that is that, yeah, there was a product called Windows XP, you know, 13 years ago, uh, you know, and what you're building is a car that has connection interfaces that didn't even exist in technology when Windows XP came out. And for all the reasons that I've talked about, you know, your ecosystem is completely different than Windows XP. And so, you know, what you end up with is that what STLC is rooted in is that what we're trying to do is make it cheaper to fix bugs because that's the whole concept that the earlier you try looking for bugs, it's going to be cheaper to fix bugs. But if, you, but if you go back to what we talked about in the beginning, you know, with the price elasticity for attackers and all of that, 
You know, that's, that's not even a good game to play. So even if you master this concept of like, well, I'm fixing bugs cheaper, well, all you're doing is you're ma playing the whack-a-mole a little bit more economically, which is a losing game, by the way. So, you know, you're losing at a lower cost instead of losing at a higher cost. I suppose that's some kind of win, but, you know, not really ideal. Uh, and then I just want to close out for some, with some advice for defenders, I guess. Uh, I think this big one, I mean, this is probably the biggest one, and I think it sort of naturally follows from everything I was trying to talk about, which is, I think what companies should try and do more is really, you know, pick your poison. What I mean by that is sort of depart a little bit from, we have to fix, you know, all the parts of everything are expected to be, you know, good. And, you know, you see this in advisors all the time, right? We take every report extremely seriously. That's not true, right? That's not true, okay? What you, what you are doing in reality is you're neglecting a whole bunch of stuff. But you're doing that, I guess, uh, you know, as a byproduct. And what I would think, or what I would argue that Wendell should be doing is think about, okay, okay, we can't do everything. You know, come up with some kind of strategy of what you're going to do and, and try and, you know, cram everything through that. Of course, there's sort of uh, danger in that as well. You know, there's the adage that, you know, when all you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I still think that that's a better strategy. And, you know, I've picked on Google a little bit, but I think at the end of the day, you know, they should be applauded for, you know, clearly, you know, they, you can see in the type of things that they're doing that they have a concept of like which parts of Android they're more trying to uh, protect, you know, and they're focusing on that. And yes, it's true that some things are left on the side and as you can see, that's not very good, but at least, you know, they are getting, you know, pretty good at protecting some parts of it. Another example I think is like Samsung, with, you know, with, no with Knox. You know, it's not a perfect thing, but clearly they have made up their mind about like in what type of ways, what are the things they're trying to mitigate, and they are just focusing pretty much on that. Uh, and another thing, I mean, this is almost sentimental, so I wanted to get this in here, but uh, I mean, realistically, I don't think it's something that people will say, oh yeah, right, let's do that. Um, but I think it's still true that, uh, like I was saying before, you know, to the outside, vendors always talk about like, oh, we take everything seriously. Uh, but, you know, that's not really true, especially the tune of, you know, guess what? Product security teams have roadmaps. They almost always know at any certain point of time that this current mitigation or whatever that we have, this is not perfect for X, Y, Z reasons. We know that it has these mistakes and we have it penciled in for 2017 or 2018 or whatever to improve this. But, you know, in their public... Uh, 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 PR, that's not what they say, you know. You don't really see a paper on Samsung Knox saying, well, this is kind of nice, but there's all these ways that it's bad, right? That's, that's not typical. Here I, I, I would like to uh, assign some credit to Apple, actually. If you, their security white papers are kind of nicer in this way, so, you know, they don't really shy away from pointing out things that are limits or so, but that's not typical, I think, and I think vendors should do that more. And the big reason for that, and I'm not just trying to say this because that would be nice. I mean, it would be nice. But I think a big reason for this, and this is what I've seen again and again when I was on the incident response side of things, is that at the end of the day, it's not economical for you to not do this because what happens is that you get these random interruptions. So you've assigned your resources to some kind of roadmap where you're expecting you're going to do something later. And then randomly, somebody publishes a result which basically boils down to researcher finds out that thing works in exactly the way the vendor always knew it worked, right? Nonetheless, you know, now you have this outside pressure to throw everything in the wind, forget what you've been doing, now you have to do something else because, oh, now you have to fix this faster. Think about, you know, Tesla and, you know, MCU firmware verification. And so this is really not an economical way to look at you know, the sparse resources that you have. Of course, if on the other side, you know, if you're being a little bit more honest about like gaps in the stuff that you have, you know, you can forego that a little bit. And then the final point I would like to make is that, that I think vendors should really do is, you know, going back to the very beginning, this thing that I really like to beat on is, you know, just raise the cost for attackers. I think this is what, you know, and the PAX team, and I think this is a great, Thing to end on since obviously you know Pipach is from Hungary as well. Long, long time ago they wrote this great article on, on ASLR and the cargo cult uh, you know in security. And what they are essentially talking about is this mantra that anything that makes things harder is good is a complete fallacy. And this idea that any mitigation is a good thing. It's like any PR is good PR they, they, you know people say. Anything that makes it worse for the attacker that's good. 
And I posit that that's not true at all. I think there are a lot of things that, you know, people do and they sort of think, oh, yeah, but this is a mitigation. It, it makes things a little bit harder, so that must be good. But in reality, you're just building up these walls around your product that essentially, at the end of the day, create these safe havens for attackers. So you look at obscurity, you look at firmware encryption. These are things that, if you think back to what I talked about, where well, you have downstream customizations, you have problems with patching misalignment and all of these things, you have problems with regression testing. You know, now, think about having those problems when you've made your product more obscure, when you've added firmware encryption. You have essentially made it a safe haven for the attacker because it's going to be harder for you to fix things. So now, you know, the hard-earned coin is going to, you know, stay there for a longer time. Uh, and then the last, last, last thing I would like to say that really, uh, I think, uh, contrasting SDLC vendors should build in a little bit is, you know, I think it would be good to have a departure from this work process where, where security has to be baked in. But people use that as a convenient way to say security doesn't get its own time. We don't have a development life cycle where we did all this, now we have a supposedly working finished product. Well, now the security team can come and, you know, think like an attacker and work on the final product and look for bugs on a thing that actually works, that's not buggy, that they have enough, you know, production samples of to build a test harness for fuzzing, all of these things. That's not how things work because the way they work is like as DLC, you know, security has to be done in parallel. And that means that security is being done from scratch all the way up to, oh, final shippable product ship. And so that means that your entire time as the defender, you're working on essentially a work in process, a work in progress product. You're working on something that's not working, that you don't have enough samples for to, you know, like I mentioned, build fast farms um, and these things. So at the end of the day, you're, you know, you're supposed to be finding bugs that, oh, by the way, will be added later. Um, and so that's about it. And I'm going to skip this because we're way over time. Um, and I think with that, I would like to thank you for your patience and your attention. And we probably don't have time for questions now, so we probably, but we'll see. In any case, thank you very much and enjoy the conference.